You're full of puns tonight. <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is Michael. I'm an alcoholic. And welcome to the Friday night 8.30 uh, meeting here at the club. Uh, this is a back to basics meeting. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, this is an open meeting. Um, for those of you who've been here before who, who sense that things uh, look a little different, or for those of you who've not been here before, uh, to let you know, this particular month, just for the four, we're in week three of four weeks. Uh, this particular month, uh, we're taping the Back to Basics meetings um, for purposes we haven't completely identified yet, although it will certainly be for use in recovery and for use in helping others. Uh, obviously, there's the presentation style and the lights, which perhaps provide something of a distraction. We, um, we thank you for your tolerance around that, giving us an opportunity to uh, you know, find a hopefully new and interesting ways to, uh, to carry the message and help others. Uh, also, I want to be clear that around that, in terms of paying attention to the traditions, uh, I am and will be the only person on this tape. Um, uh, to take it even a step further, because we always encourage questions and comments in the meeting. Um, if you ask a question or make a comment, which you're absolutely more than welcome to do, and you even have an issue with your voice potentially being on a tape, uh, let me know and we'll, um, we'll honor that and we'll take care of it. Uh, any questions about that before we sort of officially get started? Okay. So uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to share with you all an interpretation of the steps that a good buddy of mine uh, back in New York City, where I'm from, always used to share with me. And I always give him credit. I don't know that he made it up, but I know that it came to me from him. Uh, this is my good friend Gavin, uh, back in New York, who always summed up the 12 steps in the following way. He always said to me, one, two, and three got me right with God. Four, five, six, and seven got me right with me. Eight and nine got me right with you. And 10, 11, and 12 keep me right with God, with me, and with you. Which, for my money, is... The steps in a nutshell. It speaks to the idea that every human being in the world really has but three primary relationships. A relationship with yourself, we have a relationship with ourselves, a relationship with whatever you believe is your higher power, a relationship with God, and a relationship with your fellows, a relationship with the world around you. History has shown that by the time someone gets to us, or to a place like this, those three relationships tend to be in disarray, at the very least. And the reparations of those three relationships, and then learning how to keep them repaired and grow them, is sobriety, is recovery, right? So to go back to Gavin's quip, that I began with, mm -hmm. steps one, two, and three, what we often call the preparation steps, got me right with God. So in the first three steps, I open up a relationship with my higher power. Steps four, five, six, and seven got me right with me. Four, five, six, and seven is where I engage in the process of cleansing myself. Steps eight and nine got me right with you. Eight and nine is where I make a list of the way in which I've harmed people and deal with my fellows. 10, 11, and 12 keep me right with God, with me, and with you. Steps 10, 11, and 12 are the maintenance and growth steps. It's where we learn to maintain what we've been given by the program of action, recovery, and growing. Mm -hmm. That's the program. The steps are the program. The program and the directions on how to work the steps are in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which is our basic text. That's where our message is. That is not the same thing as our fellowship. This is a really important distinction. If you don't understand this, it's critical that you do. There are two primary columns essentially holding up what we understand as Alcoholics Anonymous. There is the fellowship and there is the program. They're both very important. Uh, to a large extent, they inform each other. But they're not the same thing. So let's get clear about this. The fellowship. 
the meetings, the coffee, the cookies and pastries, the stories, smoking cigarettes outside with your friends, the concept of doing 90 meetings in 90 days, the, son the concept of calling a sponsor every day. This is all part of the umbrella we call fellowship. The fellowship is really important, really important. Though, the fellowship has one primary purpose, and that is of support. That's what the fellowship does. It supports us. So if the fellowship is there to support us, it must be there to support us in doing something, in accomplishing something. What is that something? That something can be found in the very first chapter in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous, which we went over a couple of weeks ago, the chapter called The Doctor's Opinion, primarily composed of two letters from Dr. William Duncan Silkworth, one of the foremost experts on alcoholism in the country, if not in the world, where he tells us, if you got this thing, this illness called alcoholism, Really, your only shot at getting better, history has shown, is what the doctor refers to as a complete psychic change. Right? So here's the news. You will not, you will not have a complete psychic change in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. You will not. You will not because the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous was not designed to produce a complete psychic change in an alcoholic. The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous was designed as a place where the alcoholic can come and receive love and receive support while they have a complete psychic change. But that psychic change necessary for recovery is in the steps, which are the program, and the program is the first 164 pages of the book called Alcoholics Anonymous. It's that simple. It's that simple. Okay, so one of the, uh, the prime motives of these sessions is to show you how to get what you need. Because getting what you need is ultimately going to be on you. It's your responsibility to get your needs met. And the most effective way for you to get your needs met, history has shown, is for you to understand what's going on. What is Alcoholics Anonymous? What isn't it? Right? What is supposed to happen in meetings? What is not supposed to happen in meetings? What are meetings for? What are they not for? What does a sponsor do? What do they not do? What is their job so you know whether they're doing it or not? And also, how do you protect yourself? How do you protect yourself in Alcoholics Anonymous? Right? What do I mean by that? Well, as an example of that, for those of you who've just begun coming to meetings or really haven't been to too many meetings, um, there's a guy you are absolutely going to meet in Alcoholics Anonymous. You're going to meet him. He's an important guy. He's an important guy in that it is very important that you can identify him when he inevitably approaches you. So I want to give you some data around who this guy is so you know him when you see him. Okay? I don't know what his name will be. I don't know how old he'll be. He may be old. But even if he's not old, he probably will introduce himself as an old timer. Right? He may even tell you he's got a couple 24s under his belt. Yeah? In an effort to show you how much he knows, he may even present you with one of these pretty little coins that have a number right in the center. And chances are it'll be a big number, double digit number. Right? And he'll probably say something to you like, you want to know the secret to Alcoholics Anonymous, son? Something like that. And if you nod, perhaps even if you don't nod, he's going to tell you, stay sober, go to meetings. That's the secret. Stay sober, go to meetings. Put the plug in that jug. Right? Get back here every day. Sit in the front. Listen. Get phone numbers. Take the cotton out of your ears. Put it in your mouth. Get a sponsor. Call that sponsor every day. If you want to drink, don't drink. You think through the drink before you drink. Meeting makers make it. As soon as you realize it's him, 
run like hell. <laughs> run like hell, because that guy is as dangerous to you as a shot of whiskey. Truly. And I'd love to tell you, you're only going to meet him once. You probably will meet him multiple times. Okay? The guy you're looking for is the guy who says, our relationship, as I understand it, is not that you have a relationship with me, but that you have a relationship with God through me. That your situation is such that you're so jammed up with the wreckage of your past that you can't really establish a strong, direct connection to God right now. So I'm going to act as a conduit so that you can do the work you need to do to connect to God and stay connected to God. And that's the work we're going to do. Let's get down to it. That's exactly what I'm here to do. That's exactly what I'm doing right now. How effectively I do it, you can judge for yourself. But the one thing I can absolutely tell you you're not going to get from me in these sessions is you're not going to get some wide array of my opinions. And whatever opinions I may sprinkle in, I assure you those sentences will begin with, in my opinion, and then you can decide what to do with them. <coughs> right? And you're also not going to get some cockeyed version of Michael's program. Because Michael's program will kill you. It nearly killed me. I'm quite sure it will kill you. So what we're here to talk about is what's in the book. What is the program? We're here to get you well. Now, in this third session, we're going to talk about steps six, seven, eight, and nine. To get clear about the work we've done up till now, real quick, two sessions ago, we talked about steps one, two, and three, uh, which were referred to as our preparation steps. They prepare us for the program of action. Program of action is steps four through nine. That's where we get well, that's where we recover. Step one simply tells us what is our problem. It's an information gathering step. So is step two, right? No one's worked in steps one and two. They're information gathering steps only. What's your problem? What the book told us, what we found out from Dr. Silkworth, as I mentioned before, is an alcoholic has a physical allergy to alcohol, which means once they take a drink, they have no ability to determine how many drinks will follow that drink. Might be two, might be 20, depending on which night you catch them. And that that physical allergy is compounded by a mental obsession, which means that when we stop drinking, much as we may not want to go back to it, we will become restless, irritable, and discontented. Sort of a fancy way of saying can't live in our own skin, which will eventually get painful enough that we will reach for the only thing we know of that will quell the pain, which is the booze, trigger the physical allergy again, and we're off to the races. That's our problem. Step two tells us what the solution to that problem is. Power greater than human power. God. If you don't like the word God, use a different word. Use a different word. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Allah, Esu, great spirit, creative intelligence, universal subconscious mind. Call it freaking Phil as far as I'm concerned. Are you willing to believe there's a power greater than you? Yes, good. Step two. Step three, make an affirmative declaration, which we did, based on your understanding of the problem and the solution, that you are ready to do whatever you got to do to bring the solution to light. That's one, two, and three in a nutshell. That was an hour. <clears throat> right? Then in the last session, we actually got down to work. Steps four and five. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We talked about the fact that it needed to be on paper. We talked about the fact that fearless doesn't mean without fear. It means the courage to walk through fear. We talked about the fact that the three major building blocks of a proper fourth step are our resentments, our fears, and harms done others, the way in which we've hurt people. We talked about the fact there's not one right way to do a fourth step. We gave you a pretty firm suggestion. And I think I was very clear about the idea that the way to do it wrong would be to withhold information or lie. And that once we've done that to the best of our ability, in the fifth step, we're going to sit down with, of course, ourselves, whatever we believe in, in terms of higher power, and another human being, maybe our sponsor, maybe not, maybe someone from recovery, maybe not, but another human being, and spill it. 
and you give it all up to one human being, to one other person. Tell someone the whole story. Right? And once and it says in the fifth step, all this stuff, all this poison that's been killing us that we inventoried in the fourth step, that it's all about to be cast out. That's the term they use in the book. It's going to be cast out. We're going to kind of vomit it all up so that we can look at the causes and conditions of our failure, the patterns of what's been blocking us from God. And that brings us to the sixth step. Right? So we're going to pick up in the sixth step, and actually we'll be beginning on page 76. The sixth step itself, and if you'd like to follow along, there, there are big books, certainly use your own book. You don't need to follow along if you don't want to. Um, the, step, the, the sixth step reads, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. That's the sixth step, right? And I told you in the previous sessions that each step comes with a principle attached to it. So there are 12 principles that co-align with 12 steps. The principle for the sixth step is willingness. Willingness, okay? So the sixth step in the book, and again now we're on page 76, uh, if you're following along, you'll probably notice, if you've never noticed before, that page 76 is a pretty heavy-duty page in that it's got step 6, step 7, step 8, and the beginning of step 9. Right. So looking at step 6, step 6 reads, if we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step 6. Answer what to our satisfaction? Right? And this is something that the book does often, and I've probably referred to this before. That oftentimes in the big book, what will happen is they will introduce a new step. And as they're introducing the new step in the first sentence of the new step, they will make reference to the step before it. So that's what they've done here. If we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step uh, six. Answer what to our satisfaction? Well, if you look at the page before it, the end of the fifth step on page 75, it tells us that at the end of the fifth step, we go home, we're going to need an hour of time, an hour of quiet time probably, for ourselves to sit with God. Right? It says that we're going to want to have our big books with us, open them up to the page that contains the steps, which is the first page of chapter 5, How It Works, and ask ourselves, have we been complete in our work? Have we been complete in our work? So this is the point at which, if you've been less than complete, if you've lied, if you've left something off in the fourth step, if you've left something off in the fifth step, this is the point at which you're going to want to get current about it. Right? And they're warning you, don't go wandering into the second half of the steps with a shaky foundation. That's why the sixth step begins with, if we can answer to our satisfaction that we have, in fact, been complete in our work, then we're going to look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable, right? That's the principle of this step, willingness, right? They're reminding you there is work to be done. If you all remember, going back one last time to the fifth step, that in the fifth step promises, we are told the feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly, right? So they let you know around the time that you're finishing up five, you may very well have the experience of feeling like the drink problem has lifted. Right? Now, obviously, that's a nice thing. You know, this might be the point where if you've been sort of sitting on your hands every day trying to stay away from a drink, this may well be the point where you start to experience some relief around that. It's great, but they're also warning you, don't let that give you the impression that the problem has been removed. Because that's not going to happen until we move from 9 into 10, 11, and 12. Right? So they're coming back to the idea that willingness is indispensable. There's work to be done. We need to stay willing. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things we have admitted are objectionable? All right, so here we go. Step six directions. First thing you're getting is a question. Are you ready to let God remove from you the things you've admitted are objectionable? What did you admit is objectionable? Who knows? What did we admit is objectionable? Give me some examples. Everything in right, such as? What did we admit is objectionable? Retaliatory. Fear. The idea of revenge, fear. What else? Anger. Resentment. Anger, resentment, jealousy. Great. What else? Dishonesty. Dishonesty, envy, 
codependency, self-loathing. It could be an endless list, right? But by this point, we probably have a pretty good idea of the main things we've been able to look at and say, wow, these are objectionable. The level of dishonesty in my life is objectionable. I object to it, right? The level of selfishness in my life is objectionable. Are we ready to get our hands off these things? <coughs> Let God take them. <coughs> it seems like it would be an obvious answer, doesn't it? <coughs> I mean, it, it felt that way to me. When my sponsor asked me the question, are you now ready to let God remove from you all this stuff that you've admitted is objectionable, my first instinct was, of course, totally, take it, right? It's all trash. I don't want it. I'm not suggesting that to some extent wasn't a real reaction in me or that that wouldn't in fact be a genuine reaction in you. And without question, in most cases, the sixth step can be rather quick. Something that can be done right on the back end of the fifth step, and you'll be able to move right into seven. But not for everybody. And the reason I mention that is, and, and I'm going to just to give you a little bit of my own experience during Through Hope around why this is an important piece. Um, <clears throat> I can honestly say, this is just for me, this is just for me, um, that if it wasn't for lying, cheating, stealing, fighting, drinking, drugging, and a whole host of other behaviors. If it wasn't for those tools, which is what they were, which is what they are, I genuinely believe that I would have been a teen suicide. Does anyone else identify with that? A couple of us? I don't think I would have lived long enough to get to you people. Those were my tools. In my youth, that's what I had. I didn't yet have the tools of meetings and sponsorship and praying and meditating and reading the big book and literature. I, I, didn't, I didn't know you people were doing this. I didn't know this way of living existed. I had lying, cheating, stealing, fighting. I mean, that's what I had. And those things worked for me. Dishonesty served me a very genuine purpose in my youth. So did selfishness. All, they all did. It may not have been, they may not have been the healthiest tools, but they were the only ones I had, and they worked. Therefore, it would seem that my connection to them might be a little deeper than it seems at first glance. Does that make sense to anybody else? Right? I mean, the idea of not, like in terms of dishonesty, the idea of not being considered a liar anymore that sounded great. The idea of getting up every morning and walking out amongst the humans, living in my skin, without the tool of dishonesty constantly at my disposal, wow, I don't know about that. That didn't sound so appetizing to me. That sounded pretty terrifying to me. Right, so if that's the case, if I can say to my sponsor, you know, if he says, can you, can you let God remove from you all the things you have admitted are objectionable? And I say, all but dishonesty. I don't, I'm, I don't think I have the willingness to let go of dishonesty. Then perhaps he'll say, okay, so take a day or two and pray for the willingness to be willing. If I can say that I am ready to have God remove from me all the things that I've admitted are objectionable, good. Now we get a second question. Can he now remove them? Can he take them all? Every one, right? Which is another way of saying, can God pull this off? This is a little different from the second step, am I willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? Now I'm being asked, can this power pull off what it would seem is a pretty large task? I would offer to any of you who were willing to believe in a power greater than yourself, but are not sure that you're ready to believe that God can remove all these things you've admitted are objectionable. I would offer you to feel free to take as an article of faith that God was able to do that for me. Right, so feel free to pray to my understanding of a higher power and ask the God who helped Michael to help you. 
if that's what you need to do the sixth step, that would be perfectly appropriate. Right? And then notice at the end of the sixth step is a little caveat, which I just spoke to. If we still cling to something, we will not let go, like dishonesty or something else. We ask God to help us be willing. They put it right there in the paragraph. So it can't possibly be that unusual for people to have the experience of not necessarily being willing to let go of something they admitted was objectionable, because they told you exactly what to do if that happens. All right? Questions about step six? Anything at all? No? OK. Step seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. The principle of step seven, humility. Great word. Humility, by the way, is the direct opposite of ego and pride. And they literally operate as if they're on a scale, i.e., when we grow in humility, ego and pride go down, and vice versa. They operate together. Right? So now that I've become willing to let God remove from me all the things I've admitted are objectionable, now I'm going to humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings. Shortcomings are things I don't have enough of. I'm short on them. I need more. Okay. Um, step seven is but a prayer. Not only a prayer, or just a prayer, but it is a prayer. That's what step, step seven is. Very similar to the third step. Right? The third step is actually we officially call a declaration. Uh, but again, it's something we're going to put into our lives, put into our practice. So this is the point at which, if you've been saying the third step declaration every morning, as we advised in the first session, this would be the point at which you add the seven step prayer to the third step declaration. Right? That that would become your morning ritual at this point maybe 90 seconds of your time. Right? Still not really being asked for a whole lot for the life beyond your wildest dreams that you seek. So let's take a look at this prayer that we're adding into our lives. Seven step prayer, same chapter, into action page 76, second paragraph, right there on the first line. I am now willing that you should have all of me good and bad. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Now, if you're someone who's familiar with the third step declaration, you might notice that the seven step prayer is not that remarkably different from the third step declaration. In that, it seems to be asking for sort of similar stuff. The tone of it is similar. There is one very important difference. And that is the specificity of the prayer. The seventh step prayer is far more specific than the third step declaration. And it would have to be. It would have to be. In that, when we first say the third step declaration, we're still in the preparation steps. Therefore, we haven't yet begun to what? We're in the preparation steps, so we haven't begun to what? Therefore, we haven't begun to. Who said it? Change. We haven't begun to change. Right? So when I say in the third step declaration, God, I give myself to thee, what am I giving God? I mean, honestly, hell if I know. I have no idea what I'm giving God. I have no idea who I am. Right? There's, I'm not saying it's not powerful, but it's sort of nebulous. God, I give myself to thee. I mean, like, I don't know what I'm giving you. I don't know who you are. But if you're there, get in the game, brother. I need some help here. Very powerful, but rather vague. Now you come to the seventh step prayer. Right? You've done a proper fourth step, searching, fearless. You've sort of spilled it all in the fifth step. You've started to understand what is objectionable. You've started to understand the causes and conditions of your failure. Look how specific this is. I'm now willing, which means I wasn't before now, I'm now willing that you should have all of me good and bad. You actually need to know some stuff to say that. All of me good and bad. I now have a working knowledge of my assets and my defects. Right? Here comes the word now a second time. I now ask, I now ask, I pray that you now remove from me 
every single defect of character. Again, I gotta know what every single defect of character is to be able to say that. Right? So very specific. Also, note that it doesn't say I ask that you remove from me every single defect of character, period. Why would it not say that? Impossible. Impossible. That's not gonna happen. That's why it doesn't say that. Every single defect of character gone? That's never gonna happen. That's gonna be made very clear to us in step 10 in the next session. Right? Every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows, to you and my fellows, right? That's, that's the whole gig, that's what it's about. So what I'm saying to God is, whatever amount of my character defects are standing in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows, right? Because that's our primary purpose, right? I'm in step seven, God, I'm almost there. Twelfth step, I gotta start my primary purpose. Right? Whatever is in the way of me doing my primary purpose, that's got to go now. So coming back to the idea of dishonesty, when I first said the seven-step prayer, you're going back now oh, you know, well over a decade. Right? The, the amount of dishonesty that was in the way of me being of service to God and to my fellows, that's been gone over a decade. The rest of my dishonesty, <coughs> I'm working on. It's better. It's better. It's a lot less dishonesty in my life now than there was 10, 12 years ago. But the point is that for the rest of this session, you can absolutely count on the idea that every word out of my mouth is the gospel truth. If you catch me out in the parking lot, I can't guarantee you anything. I don't really know what my motive would be to lie to you out in the parking lot, but I can't guarantee you anything. I can't tell you there's no dishonesty in my life. I don't really believe for a second that a life completely devoid of dishonesty is possible, nor is it prudent. But I certainly consider myself a pretty honest person. I certainly can you know, spend a lot more time being honest than dishonest, and when I'm dishonest, I know how to deal with it, and I don't keep secrets, and I know how to get on top of it, and I know how to make proper amends, and I know how to keep my side of the street clean. But at the moment, what I'm saying to God is, whatever amount of my character defects are in the way of me accomplishing my primary purpose, that's what needs to go now. That's what I'm praying for. Is everyone clear on that? Mm -hmm. Questions about seven? How often do you say the prayer? Every day. The question was, how often do you say the prayer? Every day. <laughs> Right? I, if you miss a day, you're not bad, you're not wrong, you're not naughty. But the idea at this point in the work is third step declaration, seven step prayer every morning. Plus whatever else you want to say, right? I mean, if you have prayers associated with your religion or your child, I mean, pray any way you want to pray, right? But three and seven every morning is, is the directive at this point. And that effectively takes us to the end of the cleansing ourselves part of the 12 steps, right? Going back to my friend Gavin, one, two, and three got me right with God. Four, five, six, and seven got me right with me. That's what I've done at this point. In four, I inventoried all my damage. In five, I sort of coughed it up. In six, I became ready to get my hands off it. And in seven, I allowed the process to begin of having it removed from me. Now I'm ready to go out and deal with my fellows. Right? And that takes us into steps eight and nine. Step eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. The principle of the eighth step, loving kindness. Loving kindness. Okay, so the eighth step reads, now we need more action. Right? Book says this again and again and again. Now we need more action. So we are constantly told, you finished one step, good, go to the next one. That's the directions in the book, right? So this whole, um, there's no rush with the steps, take your time, do a step a month, stay on the first step for a year. That doesn't come from Alcoholics Anonymous. It doesn't come from our book. It just comes from people's ideas in the fellowship. 
And I'm sure there are some decent ideas in the fellowship. I just know that I didn't come here for the ideas of drunks and addicts. I got enough of those in the bars, and I include myself in that. The fellowship is very strong. There's a remarkable amount of intelligence and competence around a whole host of subjects in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you, little by little, can glean out who knows what. So if you make a friend in the Fellowship, and they're a plumber, and one night your pipes burst, and you got that guy's number, call him. Hey, listen, I got, my, you know, I got a foot of water in my house. Any, any ideas? That, that could be really useful. Don't call me. I mean, not when your pipe's burst. Don't call me. I can't help you. It would be crazy of you to call me. So there's, there's plenty of data in the fellowship, and you can figure out who knows what. And I've gotten so many opportunities in the fellowship where people have showed up and helped me, etc. Okay, that's fine. But that's not really what we're talking about here. Now we need more action. There's work to be done. Right? At no point in this book, anywhere, does it say or come close to saying or infer or suggest anything along the lines of, oh, you finished that step? Good. Take it easy. Take a weekend. Good for you. Not because they don't want to be kind to us and gentle with us, but the point is, we have a lot of history that tells us concretely that the luxury of taking your time is not the luxury of alcoholics trying to recover from a hopeless state of mind and body. You want to take your time? Take your time. That's your business. But this book's about getting well. These sessions are about getting well. Is it a race? Damn straight it's a race. It's a race if you don't like dying. It's a race if you read the book and find out that it says that we take to this program the way the drowning sees life preservers. The way the drowning sees life preservers. Think about that. That's right out of our text. Do you ever see anybody drowning who got a life preserver thrown to them and says, eh, I'll, you know, in a second I'll get there. It's good to know it's there, you know. So again, our direction saying now we need more action. Without which we find, listen to this, faith without works is dead. Does anybody know where that comes from? Bible. Bible. The Bible. It's a biblical quote. Faith without works is dead. It actually says that three times in the first 164 pages in those words and says it like another eight or ten times in similar words. Faith without works is dead, which means that the quality of your faith and consequently the quality of your recovery will never ever be based on what you think or on what you feel. It's going to be based on what you do action. If you just heard me say that what you think or what you feel doesn't count or isn't important, you either misheard me or I said it wrong. There's nobody saying that. What you think is very important. What you feel is very important. But it's not going to be the foundation of your recovery or the foundation of your faith. It's important to know that. Faith without works is dead. Now, let's look at steps eight and nine. Right? It says, we have a list of all persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. Therefore, we've just been told this, this list we need to make in the eighth step, we already have it. We already have it. We already have it. How do we already have it? What are they talking about? Our fourth step inventory. Right? So you're getting your fourth step inventory back out because we pretty much already have this list. If you did the fourth step properly, you should have a list of people you've harmed on there. One would think those would shift right over to your eighth step list. you harmed these people. We'll need to make amends to these people. Also, you should have a list of resentments. And when you dealt with your resentments, you should have also at some point dealt with your part in those resentments. And you may have come to the conclusion that some of the people you resented, you also hurt. Not all of the people, not everyone on your resentment list, is going to be fodder for your ninth step amends. But you may well have realized there are certain people you had resentments with that you also caused harm to. right? Some of that might come out in the processing of the fifth step. Those two 
would move to your eighth step list. Once you've done that, you should be done with 95, 98% of your eighth step list. The only thing that might get added is if there's something you realized you forgot in four and five that you now want to add, or perhaps there's been some damage or you've hurt someone between steps five and eight that needs to be on there. The long and the short of it is this should not take very long. This should be a very simple list to make. Right? Let's remember, though, there's two directives in the eighth step. That there were two instructions. We had a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. That's something else. I can very clearly remember sitting down with my first sponsor with my uh, eighth step list completed, very proud of myself, you know, and handing it to him, and him looking it over and going, yeah, this looks pretty complete. He said, so every single amend on this list you're, you're willing to make. And I went, whoa, what? <laughs> this prick I'm never talking to. <laughs> right? And he said to me, oh, well, then we're going to be on eight for a bit. You know, and I sort of, I was crushed. Right? I hit this face like he was punishing me. And he said to me, this is what our text says. You've made the list. You need to be willing to make every amend on this list. He said, listen, this one guy you're talking about, and this one particular amend I will tell you the story of in step nine, he said, this one guy, he said, you don't have to do him first, right? You don't have to know how you're going to make that particular amend. You don't have to know when you're going to make that particular amend. But as long as you can look me in the eye and say, I'm never making it, you may need to take a day or two and pray for the willingness to be willing. Does that sound familiar? Right? Which in this particular, I didn't actually have to do that on step six. I did have to do it on step eight. Before he would let me move to nine, uh, and this is probably the only time that I ever heard my sponsor talk to me about the rate at which to do the steps. And that's only because the book told him to. Right? I spent two days in quiet meditation, not two full days, but two days doing some meditation, asking God for the willingness to be willing. And once I found it, we moved on to nine. Okay. Questions about eight? Anything at all? Okay. So now we move to step nine. Step nine made direct amends to such people, the people that I became willing to make amends to, wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. That's that latter part of the steps of that particular step, is what a lot of alcoholics and addicts want to sort of use as a loophole. We're going to speak to that in a moment and get clear what that piece looks like, except when to do so would injure them or others. Okay? Uh, the principle of step nine, justice. The principle of step nine is justice. So step nine, we subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. This is still on page 76 now, third paragraph. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. Right? We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our efforts to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. Self-will run riot. They're speaking back to <coughs> that in the book. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. See how the book just did that again? Once again, they're letting you know. There are times at which the book will say, here is what would be a reasonable reason to pause in your step work for a short period of time, right? Which comes back to the idea of check your motives, right? So letting you know, if you haven't the will to do this, we're going to ask until it comes. Remember, it was agreed at the beginning, so they're now going to call our attention to a verbal <coughs> agreement we made in the beginning, and now you're going to notice italics, yeah, that squiggly writing. They don't use that a whole lot. They're very sparing with the italics, right? The agreement we made is that we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. What are they essentially quoting there? Does anybody know? How it works. Uh, how it works. Chapter 5, how it works. Right? If you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, if you've decided two things, this is what a lot of people call step zero, because there are two things you need before you can even move to one, really. If you've decided you want what we have, what do we have? Right. Recovery. Recovery. Right? We're not talking about people who don't drink. What we have, recovery. Right? If you see something attractive in us, 
if you can sit down with us and say, man, these people are a little happy for my taste, mm -hmm. right? I don't know that I want to go to their dances or be friends with them. I kind of dislike them. And yet, they seem to have exactly what I've always been looking for. And I'm pretty sure I would do anything to get it. And I don't even know what it is. Right? If you have that experience, you want what we have, good. Stick around. That's not going to be enough, though. It's a good start. If you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. Right? And let's face it, the first day of AA, for many of us, it's not that hard a question. Because a lot of us come in here with the glorious gift of desperation. You willing to go to any length? Yes, I am. Yes. I would have set myself on fire my first day at AA if somebody told me to. That's how desperate I was. Right? Then, a couple of months goes by. I was sleeping again. I could go to the bathroom like a normal person. Right? My girlfriend let me back in, put a couple of bucks in my pocket, found a job. Right? Then you come to the threshold of step nine, and it's like, do you want me to do what? Right? Which is why right at the beginning of the step, they say... Remember at the beginning, when you said you'd go to any lengths? Remember that? In case you were wondering what any lengths looks like, this is a good example. <laughs> Step nine is a good example of going to any lengths. Right? So throwing it right back at you. With love, at the moment, page 77, first line. Fifth word on that line, actually, if you'll count for me. Page 77, first line, fifth line, uh, uh, fifth word on that line. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order. That's what I'm doing at the moment in this ninth step. I'm trying to put my life in order. But, there's a caveat, but this is not an end in itself. That means there's a bigger picture for me to pay attention to. While I'm putting my life in order, making these amends, there's a bigger picture that I need to pay attention to. Okay, what you're about to hear if any of you, and I'm really clear nobody's actually asked me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. If any of you said to me, hey, Michael, what do you think is the most important line in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? And again, nobody has. Somebody want to ask me? What's the most important line, Michael? What's you know, I'm happy you asked. <laughs> our real purpose, in case you're wondering what our real purpose is, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. That's what this whole deal is about. That's our real purpose. Let me be clear, it doesn't have to be your real purpose. But that doesn't change the fact that it's the <clears throat> real purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us, right? So our real purpose is not to stop drinking alcohol or doing drugs. Our real purpose is not even to do the steps. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. <clears throat> I got to put down the substance to be able to work the steps effectively. And I work the steps to achieve my real purpose. <clears throat> That's why the steps end with the words, practice these principles in all your affairs. That's the deal. That's why the real test of one's sobriety, recovery, is not really so much what goes on in here, but what goes on out there. Of course, it's nice to be able to come into the meetings and function well and effectively and comfortably within this climate. But honestly, how hard is that? If you can't come into the 12-step rooms and get along fairly reasonably, you probably need some help beyond the 12-step room. Do you know? I mean, you walk in and they're... There's coffee brewing, and hey, how are you, and hugs, and here's my phone number. And I mean, it's, you know, uh, but the reality is when the hour's up, we all go back out into a world that really doesn't give a crap that we're sober, and pretty much never does what we want them to do the way we want them to do it. There, it's the way you navigate that that is the test of your recovery. You know, often is the time especially in these kinds of meetings where, where, where I, I hold more of a, uh, a teaching role, if you will. Um, it, oftentimes after meeting a newcomer, or what I 
believed to be a newcomer, will approach me and say something <clears throat> abundantly kind, like, uh, wow, seems like you have a really strong recovery, right? Which I absolutely hear as the compliment that it is. If I sense they're brand new, what I will often say to them is, out of curiosity, what gives you that impression about me? Why do you say that? Inevitably, they will pretty much always say the exact same thing. Does anybody know what it is? You know how to speak. What is it? Say it louder. You know how to speak. The way you talk. The way you talk. And the reality is the way I talk has nothing to do with my recovery. Nothing. I could smoke crack and do this. <laughs> I'm, truly, I could. Ask my wife. I could. It's, and it's not, I, I'm not bragging. The reality is there are so many more things in this world that I can't do than can do. One of the things I can do is public speaking. I did a lot of it before I came to recovery. This is a natural skill for me. I appreciate that it's useful to people. I don't discount it. But it has nothing to do with my recovery. The reality is if you actually wanted to know what kind of recovery I have, you'd, you'd kind of have to follow me around for a couple days. You know? You'd have to see the husband I am to my wife. You'd have to see the father I am to my little girls. You'd have to see how I do you know, in Jewel when it's a new clerk and I'm in a rush. right? You'd have to see how I handle it when I'm on 355 and someone cuts me off. You know, what kind of person am I on the days where it's not entirely convenient for me to be nice, decent, generous, kind, empathic? I'm not saying I do that perfectly. I'm saying that's my recovery. Right? Our real purpose, to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Um, page 77, fourth line on the page. And I'm going to ask you to go to the ninth word in that line. I know that's a lot of counting. It says, it is seldom wise. Does everyone see that? Okay. It is seldom wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce that we have gone religious. In the prize ring, this would be called leading with the chin. While we lay ourselves open to being branded fanatics or religious bores, we may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message. What that means is, excuse me, when you go out to make your ninth step amends, don't lead with the idea that you've gotten all spiritual and believe in God and pray and meditate now. Why? One, people probably don't care. Two, more importantly, you may give them the wrong impression about what Alcoholics Anonymous is. I'll tell you a little story about that. When I got sober, when I first came to recovery, I had a friend named Eric. Eric had been my running partner at the end of my active addiction. Does everyone know what I mean by running partner? Mm -hmm. right? He's the main guy I was getting high with. <laughs> right? Me and Eric, getting high every night, watching the sun come up, you know, pointing at the straights. Right? Um, when I decided to come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I got sober, he didn't. I suspected Eric needed Alcoholics Anonymous. It, it's not for me to say, obviously. I can't declare him an alcoholic. But I suspected that the time might come where he might need this place or reach out to me to bring him to this place. Yeah. As it happened, I owed Eric an amend. So you know, I'm like, whatever, a month into my recovery or whatever it is, and I'm making my amends. And uh, I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't even remember what the amend was. I, I, I probably uh, stole something from him. Some money, maybe? I knew Eric was at the very least an agnostic. Maybe not an atheist, but at least an agnostic. Right? It occurred to me, if I sit down with Eric, who may well need this place, and obviously, the amend I needed to make to Eric had nothing to do with spirituality. I stole some money from him. Right? But because I tend to be the kind of person who wants to tell you everything about me, right? I am that guy who will vomit everything about me onto the table in 15 minutes, because that's how I'll get you to love me. Right? So if for my own egotistical reasons, I decided to sit down with Eric to make my amends and say, dude, I'm meditating every day, 
and I'm getting all spiritual, and I believe in God, it's very possible that Eric would have decided, wow, I'm never going there. Right? The reality is, I didn't mention that. Three months later, maybe four, got a call from Eric. Hey, man, uh, you still going to those, uh, those meetings? Yeah, Eric, I am. Why do you ask? I don't know. Um, could I like tag along one day? Of course. Name the time. I brought Eric to a meeting. By the time Eric heard the word God in Alcoholics Anonymous, he had had a hot cup of coffee, got himself a seat, listened to the experience of another alcoholic, identified in. And by the time he heard the word God, he was ready to hear the word God. I would have sabotaged that if I decided for my own prideful reasons I needed to give him this lowdown on my spirituality when I made the amends in. Does everyone grasp that? Okay. So it's an important piece of data. Right? And they're giving us some really clear directions on how to go out and make proper amends, not just amends, proper amends. Remember, this is really the first step where we start bringing other people into our process. Right, so any step you sort of half-ass up till now, you're probably not going to hurt anybody but you, right? But this is the point at which you may hurt other people if you don't do things properly. This is the point at which you may go out there and you know take the harm that you created and make it twice as bad, right? So we're not talking about making amends. We're talking about making proper amends, and we need to know what a proper amend looks like. Right, so they're going to start telling us about uh, other kinds of amends and all the different kinds of amends uh, that get made in this program. And we're going to hit on some highlights. Um, so look at page 77. First full paragraph on page 77. First full paragraph. Uh, ninth line down in that paragraph. It says, nevertheless. Does everybody see that? Nevertheless. Right? Nevertheless. With a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. With a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. You know what they're talking about? Bit in your teeth? Or a bullet. Right. When they, back in the day when they used to pull a bullet out of you, or maybe even have to cut a limb off, right? They put a bit in your teeth so you didn't bite your tongue off, right? That's pretty intense wording they're using there, right? With a person we dislike, we're going to take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to, the, to an enemy than to a friend, of course, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. So, if you looked at my eighth step list, um, there were some people on there that I suspected in advance <coughs> would be pretty smooth. You know, there were some people on there that um, I had a pretty deep suspicion were not going to be that hard to make those particular amends. My sister would be an example of that. I had to make amends to my sister. And I, I had a pretty good idea that my sister would throw her arms around me and tell me she loved me and say, I'm just happy you're OK. And that's exactly what happened, as a matter of fact. Right? Um, there were other people on that list, let's say an ex-girlfriend that I thought stood the chance of really being a train wreck. Some of them were, some of them weren't. But the point is, standing on the threshold of the ninth step, I'm going to make the amend to my sister. I'm going to make the amend to my ex-girlfriend. But the one to my ex-girlfriend is going to carry more spiritual weight than the one to my sister. The scarier it is, the harder it is to do, the closer it will draw you to God. That's the point that they're making there. Okay. Now they take it to sort of another level, if you look down to the last paragraph on page 77, under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. Simply we tell him that we will never get over drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past. We are there to, listen, sweep off our side of the street, realizing that nothing worthwhile can be accomplished until we do so. Never, not sometimes, not now and then, not under special circumstances. Never 
trying to tell him what he should do. His faults, not discussed. So, the prick from the eighth step who I was never going to talk to? <laughs> yep. Guy named Tom. Tom was a manager at a restaurant where I worked. Okay. Tom, how can I put this nicely? Tom was a short, evil, selfish, narcissistic, alcoholic piece of crap. That's what Tom was. I hated this guy. Yeah, that's as nice as I can put it. Yeah, hated this guy. Hated, hated, hated this guy. Hated him. Worst manager you could imagine. Nasty, screamed at you, shamed you in front of a customer, never give you the day off. Awful. Right? Now, None of that had anything to do with the fact that I was a rotten employee. <laughs> right? Late. Sometimes just didn't show up. Talked back to him all the time. Stole booze, food, money. I owed amends to Tom. Didn't want to make amends to Tom. Got to make amends to Tom. What the book just told me, though, is that I'm not to mention anything about anything Tom's ever done to me when I make amends to Tom. So this becomes something of a challenge, right? <laughs> a challenge about humility. Great opportunity for humility. So the restaurant where Tom managed <clears throat> me was now closed. I knew where he worked. So I tracked him down there, and I said, can I speak to Tom? Tom got on the phone. Hello? I said, hey, Tom, it's uh, Michael Mark. And Tom said, yeah, what do you want? Well, um, I've had an opportunity to look at my life. And it's become clear to me that I owe you some amends. I was disrespectful to you. I talked back to you. I challenged you. I was selfish as an employee. I was incredibly disrespectful, at times downright nasty. I had no right to talk to you that way. I worked for you. And on top of everything else, Tom, I stole. Not much in the way of money, mostly food and booze, but I stole. So I want to be clear that in addition to the amend I'm making now, I know you don't work there anymore, I know that restaurant doesn't exist anymore, but uh, you know, if you want to put me in touch with those owners, if there's some way in which um, there's a way in which I can make financial reparations, I would also be interested in doing that. So there's a moment of silence felt longer than a moment, but I'm quite sure it was just a moment. And Tom said to me, Michael, I'll tell you what. Why don't you take your amend and shove it straight up your ass? <laughs> <laughs> and did not hang up the phone. I mean, we're still on. <laughs> huh? Straight up your ass, silence. Right? Now, the directions tell me I can't say anything to Tom about Tom. Now, I didn't have a couple of things coursing through my head to say to Tom. I had a fucking novel for Tom, right? And one of my very real character defects is intellectual arrogance. Yeah? I'm the guy who sat in the bar thinking, bring it, <laughs> bring it. I will, I will, <laughs> we won't have to fight because I'll have you crying in three minutes. That's the first thing I did when I met a new human being, sized you up, figured out what your weak spot was just in case I needed it down the road, right? So here I am holding the phone. I mean, my fist is purple. <laughs> My stomach's in knots. My head is banging. I am shaking. 
But I got a moment. This is what God gave me, a moment. See, I never had that moment before. Up until that phone call, so help me God, I had never in my life experienced having aggression come at me and not automatically responding with aggression. And it wasn't a choice. It didn't even have to be real aggression. If it was perceived aggression, I came back at you. I did that without thinking. I never even had a choice to do something else. All of a sudden, in this conversation, pissed as I was, I bought myself a moment. It was just enough to take a half a breath, and then what came out of my mouth was, you know what, Tom? I can hear that you're still angry. Based on my actions, you have every right to be. I did not call expecting forgiveness. You do not owe me forgiveness. All I was hoping for was that you'd hear me out. You've done that. I appreciate it. If there's ever a reason for us to have a follow-up phone call, you have my number. I wish you well. And we hung up. That's a miracle. <laughs> for this alcoholic, that's a miracle. And I've had that moment ever since. Choice. Does that mean I've never been aggressive with somebody in the last decade plus? No. It does not mean that. Because sometimes I have the moment and decide to be an asshole anyway. <laughs> and then, you know, with choices come consequences, and then I deal with and navigate that. Sometimes that means an amend or what have you. But I do realize now I always have the moment now. I always have the choice. That's what came to me that day with that amend. Okay. Um, the big book does talk quite a bit in the amends process about money, about owing money. And let's face it, many of us have a fair amount of financial amends. Right? It says on page 78 in the second full paragraph, most alcoholics owe money. <laughs> we do not dodge our creditors, because let's face it, that's what we've probably been doing up till now. Telling them what we are trying to do, we make no bones about our drinking, they usually know it anyway, whether we think so or not, nor are we afraid of disclosing our alcoholism on the theory it may cause financial harm. Approached in this way, the most ruthless creditor will sometimes surprise us. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they will. I will tell you from my own experience, having spent a fair amount of years in this program and coming from New York City, I have met many guys who came into recovery owing hundreds of thousands of dollars, owing over a million dollars. I've seen guys walk into recovery in holes that by no rational strategy could anybody ever climb out of. Further, I've seen guys come into recovery owing money, not to credit card companies, but to guys who would break their limbs as soon as look at them. Shylock's on the street, the mob. I can only tell you that every single one of them that worked this program and recovered figured out a way to deal with it. And in most cases, ways showed up for them to deal with it that in a million years they never could have imagined. I don't have time to tell you all the stories. I'll ask you to take it as an article of faith. But that's the truth. But that's the truth. Um, you know, I'm a uh, thief, not currently, uh, but a huge part of my, a huge portion of my eighth step uh, list was theft. Uh, I wasn't really one to go and rob people's homes, but I was an unbelievable shoplifter. I mean, God knows, I mean, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars in merchandise from places all across this country. Um, and I enjoyed stealing. Or, I mean, enjoyed it so much as I thought I enjoyed it. I mean, I, it, was a, it, was a, it, was, it was an addiction for me. I, you know, I, I wasn't the kind of person who went to the mall um, and stole. I went to the mall to steal. <laughs> it was like a day out. I'd take stuff I totally didn't need just to take it. That adds up. You know, and I remember saying to my sponsor, what am I going to do about this? 
I mean, number one, I can't come close to paying all this back. Number two, even if I could, you know, what am I going to like wander into a Sam Goody in Tucson and be like, hey, listen, here's 30 bucks. There was this time, like, you know, when like some pimply faced teenager is going to like, what's he going to do with it? How do they, I mean, how does this work? Do time in jail. Perhaps. Yeah, certainly there's that risk as well. I mean, I, I probably wasn't going to get locked up for 30 bucks I sold at a Sam Goody, uh, uh, you know, seven years before, but there were things that could have involved the police, etc. cetera. Um, most of those financial amends I made indirectly, which again, is a whole lineage of stories. Uh, some of them I made directly. You know, there were mom and pop places. There were places where I could actually go in and deal with a manager or an owner, clean things up. I did those things over time. You know, some of them, some of them I never got to do. There are some places I could never remember. I've stayed willing to do them. Uh, so, you know, this is an area that might take a while uh, and it may demand you do some things indirectly rather than directly. Questions about that? What, what do you mean by indirect? a good question. My wife would ask that question. Right? Um, well, I sat down with my sponsor uh, and we talked about the idea of um, giving some money to charity, um, uh, giving some money to the homeless. I was in New York City, you know, so we designated a certain amount of money that I could just sort of give out, things of that nature. I, you know, because you asked, uh, because my wife asked, I'll also mention, and you're gonna be sorry now, yeah. that on my eighth step list, another thing that was fairly prevalent on there was women who I'd harmed, uh, who I had no chance of finding, i.e. last names I didn't have, first names I didn't have. Sorry, this was before you. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Similar thing. I said to my sponsor, how did these amends get made? What do I do? <clears throat> I remember one thing he said to me was, uh, and it, a suggestion. He said, in your home group, because there was a place I went to every day. He said, in your home group for the next year, I want you to resolve to never say a word to a woman counting days. And if there's a woman counting days in your home group, and at the end of a meeting, you see one of the men walk up to her, you find one of the women in the room with time and ask them if they'll go speak to her. That's your job for the next year. That, was, that would be one example of how I made indirect amends. Yeah, I've never put my hands on a woman, I never hurt a woman, but I was selfish, I was dishonest. And the idea was, at the very least, let me try to be as much a part of the solution as I was a part of the problem, right? And there are some amends that just simply can't be made indirectly, as opposed to amends you're not willing to make indirectly. Okay, finally, uh, well, at least finally in terms of different kinds of amends we make, page 83 in the third paragraph, and I promised that I would mention to, uh, I would speak to uh, the except when to do so would injure them or others part. Page 83, third paragraph. There may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would write them if we could. Some people cannot be seen, right? This is, except when to do so, would injure them or others. And I've had a lot of sponsees say to me, well, you know, my buddy Leo, uh, I stole 150 bucks from him, but he doesn't know about it. So I kind of feel like if I go up to him and tell him about it, like it would really hurt his feelings. No, that's not acceptable to do so would injure them or others. That's not really going to fit that category. Um, what they're speaking to here is, as an example, let's say um, you have a girlfriend who lives next door to you and you slept with her husband. Right, but she doesn't know about it. And then when you get sober, you want to go tell her about it. You want to get current about it and make the amend to her face. But she's still married to that man and they have a couple of children, right? It's not prudent for you to go potentially ruin an entire family because you want to feel better, right? Does that mean that amend can't be made? Not necessarily. 
Um, but that one probably will get made indirectly, in that maybe it would mean writing a letter to your friend, and rather than reading it to your friend, you'd sit down and read it to your sponsor and to God, and then tear it into pieces and let it go. That may be the best amend you can make. Okay? Except when to do so would injure them or others. I'm not saying there's a handbook on what qualifies. But again, I am saying this is why we have God and a sponsor. Every amend I made got uh, uh, processed with my sponsor first. Right? Because I want to do this properly. So <clears throat> I don't want to run off, you know, seat of my pants and just start saying I'm sorry to people. Right? Uh, other questions? around specific types of amends, anything. What about the dead? Say again? What about the dead? What about the dead? It's a very good question. Um, I guess the easiest way I can answer that is I owed amends to all four of my grandparents when I got sober. Uh, all four of them were dead when I got sober. Uh, and I made graveside amends. Wrote them letters, sat down at their gravesites, read them, cried my eyes out. Really powerful. Perfectly appropriate. Not only appropriate, kind of wonderful. I'm happy you asked. Right? Um, page 83, fourth paragraph on page 83. Now we're going to get our ninth step promises. Some people, you, you know, you'll hear these in meetings read as the promises. Uh, they're not the promises. I mean, at some point, someone decided that, they sh that these particular promises should get a sort of de facto promotion and be the promises. The only problem with that is it can give a newcomer the impression these are our only promises. And the reality is there are promises throughout this book. We we've happened across some of them. We're not done yet. But here's our ninth step promises. We are going to know, and if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. Mm -hmm. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. Wow. I can honestly tell you that nothing I've ever done, and I've done some messed up stuff, do I have regret about. Everything I've ever done that harmed anybody, I've also at this point used to save a life. Okay? We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity, anyone else know that feeling? <laughs> will disappear, right? That feeling of being useless will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. We will actually start to care about what's going on with people who aren't us. Miracle. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. That's a big one. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. Think about that. Situations that historically froze you. Like you had no idea what to do. The kind of situations that completely freaked you out. All of a sudden, you will intuitively know how to handle them. You'll just know what to do. It's a big promise. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Right? And it goes on to say, are these extravagant promises? They may, you, they may seem like they are. We don't think so. Again, this is an experiential book, not a theoretical book. They were doing this for about five years when they wrote it. So they're saying, these aren't extravagant promises. We've been watching them come true, right? And there's a reason we don't call them the ninth step maybes. <laughs> they're promises, ironclad. You do the work as it's laid out in the book with a sponsor up to this point, and you 100% can assume that these things will start to happen to you. They are being fulfilled among us sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. So some of them will happen faster than others, but they'll all happen. They will always materialize if we work for that. If you do the work, they will materialize. That takes us to the end of the program of action. That means you are now on the precipice of recovery. Right? As you begin your ninth step amends, we're going to move to this in the next session, and start working 10, 11, and 12 as you move from 9 into 10, 
That's where the cycle of physical allergy and mental obsession cracks open. And you become recovered. Right? And this is the kind of thing that was ultimately designed to take a month, if not less, or weeks. You want it that quick, it's yours. You want it slower, that's okay too. If you've come this far, and you're interested in knowing what it looks like as a recovered person to spend every day for the rest of your life maintenancing and growing your recovery and learning more and more about being happy, joyous, and free, join us in the next session. We'll have that conversation. We got a nice way of closing. Let's circle up. <laughs>